Thank you, uh, the team. Uh, I'm sure you guys cannot see what's going on behind. Um, we have a very small team. This is probably the, the least number of people that I have seen uh, participating in the ministry today, and they, they were still able to pull off uh, a live streaming with whatever that we can. They, they give their best. And I want to encourage them with the word of God. And I, I just feel the urge to share this from the book of 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 12. He says, my grace is all you need. My power works best in weaknesses. So now I'm glad to boast my weaknesses so that the power of Christ can work through me. That's why I take pleasure in my weakness and in the insults, hardships, persecutions, and troubles that I suffer for Christ. For, I am, for when I am weak, then I am strong. Such a, I just want to bless the, the people here, uh, even Kylie trying to do a switcher. Uh, for those of you who doesn't know what that is, it's like the guy who switched the, the angle. And everybody, everybody pull together, make this thing work. Pastor who's doing the worship leader for the first time after 16 years, we really appreciate that. The anointing that comes, even the song is just uh, such a, uh, maybe not, not, not the most uh, new song, but it's not, it does not matter. The, what matters is the anointing, right? And when we are lacking in numbers, the heaven fill it up. And that's why the, the, the feeling of the, um, God's presence is even thicker because when we are weak, then he's showing up to strengthen all of us. All right. Uh, for those of you in the live stream, uh, really sorry that we cannot really uh, show you the presentations, but I already try to, uh, to forward it to your WhatsApp group. Please open along with that. I'm going to try to do my best to navigate that, and I will let you know where we are. We are definitely on the first page that shows your life. Again, welcome. Happy Sunday. Good to see all of you, wherever you are. I hope you're all safe, contained, happy at home, and wherever you are. And if you're sick or if experiencing anything, we pray that you'll, you'll get better very soon. And this week, actually, this, this theme, Alive, is going to be a theme that our church is going to go through together for many, many, not many, many, for a few, the next few years. And it's, it's called Alive. And so that's kind of like the, the, broader, the broader theme of the church, uh, our, our vision for this year. Uh, and for this year specifically, we're talking about a life in clarity. Such a, such a fitting theme um, for um, some of us because as, as we all know that um, COVID, the Omicron is just kicking in a full gear right now. Everybody is being concerned because the rate of infection is very high, like the highest ever seen. Uh, a lot of people are concerned with their kids, not vaccinated and everything like that, right? So, you know, as much as we try to be, uh, trying to do, be alive, I, I totally can empathize and understand that, you know, it's, you're not, we're not all 100% feeling alive. We're not like, you know, pumping up and happy and, and you know, with, with, with a good spirit. And this is, I think this is such a fitting thing because it really reminds us that we, we really need to, to, to work really, to, to, to work the best that we can to stay alive, you know, uh, alive meaning active going. And before I start this sermon, I just want to share with you um, my story last week. Uh, basically, after the church last week, I decided, I decided to, to take my chances to uh, wait in line to get my, um, my booster shots. I did not make an appointment. I just feel like I just want to take it that day. I end up going to Walmart, ask, hey, do you have anything available? And they say, yeah, we have one or two. So I say, oh, can I get one? They say, yes. Okay, so then I got my shots last week uh, after church. So everything was, work everything was okay in that afternoon. In the evening, I feel completely fine. About 3 a.m. while sleeping, I woke up with a lot of chills in my, my body. I feel meriang, you know, chills. Uh, shaking uh, for whatever reasons, and I thought like, oh, okay, that's probably a good thing. My body is fighting the, the germ. I'm going to get better. Don't worry. Try to go to sleep. So I, I did my best to go to sleep. Well, 8 o'clock mo that morning, I wake up, and as soon as I try to wake up and pull my body out, out of the bed, I really can't do it. It's like I completely lost my energy. Uh, my, my muscle is just doesn't have any power in them. I just cannot move. 
I feel extremely weak, mild fever probably, and you know, I feel thirsty and I, I feel lethargic basically. I just stay on bed for like 30 minutes and trying to figure out like what's going on. So in that moment, you know, I sort of like uh, uh, have a flash about this is probably how I'm gonna feel when I'm ready to go, ready to pass, you know? Just breathing, that's the only thing you can do is breathing and think, breathing and think. Nothing can, you cannot move anything. Your body is all aching, you're thirsty, you're tired, you're hungry. You just cannot do anything except breathe. And I feel like that's a, that's a very, very sad feeling. Such a, such a uh, what do you call this? You're not strong, right? So I feel so bad about it. And I was like, this is probably how, how people feel like when they got the COVID too. When, as they're battling the, the disease, you know, they just feel hopeless and they just feel weak, weak. And, and the, uh, what do you call it? The spirit is just not there, right? But then after 30 minutes, I said, you know what? I, I got I to gotta choose to be, to be healthy, right? I want to stay alive. So I made an attempt to basically wake myself up. I went downstairs, uh, eat a slice of bread. That's the first thing I did. I said, you know, if somebody's sick, what they need to do is they need energy, right, to, to help fight the battle, uh, to help fight the germs. So I ate that, still not feeling well, still feeling so crappy. I go about my day, rest a few, a few hours, and then in the lunch, I just get, like, maybe eat half of my portions. I really don't have any appetite, but I force myself, like, I got to eat. If I don't eat, I don't have the energy to fight. So because of that, I, I, after, the, after taking that half lunch and take a nap, then immediately after the nap, everything's back to normal. It's so miraculous. And, and I feel like thinking back, I said, it, it was probably because my, my, uh, my motivations to, to choose to stay alive, to, to choose to stay, you know, like to, to be strong. And I make that call, it's like, you know, I have to wake up, I have to eat. And I'm sure all of you, right, in, in whatever circumstances, whether you're sick, whether you're currently fa facing any difficulties right now, you want to choose to, to be alive. You want to, to, to choose normal and strong and happy, right? And so is the church. We as a, as, as a corporate, uh, the collections of the believers, uh, we also want to choose to be alive as a church. We don't want to be a church that's lethargic that was just bombarded with challenges here, specifically in this place, right? Right now, there's nobody here. Well, there's some people here. There's not a lot of people here, but we, don't, we choose not to be dictated by the, our situations. We wanna be like the one that take control, that take power into our situations. And as a church, we have to do that as well. And th I think this is, this is such a reason why I think the, the, the word alive is such a, uh, to me, is such a, a good reminder, especially in this particular situation, I feel like God is really showing out of the weakness that we have, the church needs to stay alive. And I, I hope that you can actually, if anything, you can get that point and say, you know what, together, as a person, I want to stay alive. As a, as, a, as a family, I want to stay alive. And as a church, I also want to stay alive. Amen. So uh, let's go to the next slide. Uh, I don't know if anybody can, they should be in the back. Um, so... That's the title. That's, that's why the title of today's sermon, I say, uh, the title is says, A Life Church, Church That's Alive, Greja Yang Hidup. And again, I say that we, I personally want our church to be a church that is just thriving. Meaning, thriving means it's not like it's always happy. Thriving means it's, it's always strong, despite of all the challenges. The church that is dynamics, fun, full of energy, creative, welcoming. Like this is an example where the team is so creative, we're so scrappy, even though we are just below 10 people, we can do live streaming. Because of what? Because there's an important message that we want to deliver to all of you. So everybody just trying to be productive, healthy, and that's what a life church is all about. And what a way to start that by uh, look at the book of Acts, uh, chapter one. By the way, the book of Acts is going to be the book that we're going to go through together for this year, and we're going to learn on how to be a church that's alive. Uh, so open with me, uh, the book of Acts, chapter 1, verse, uh, verse 1 to 3. Uh, all right. Maybe one more, Pastor. Yeah, let's just go to the English one. It says over here, I think you are on, should be on slide 4 for those of you at home. 
It says, in my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven. After giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen, after his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proof that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. So as you can see here, the word of God is here saying that, you know, um, the, the church that's alive, as you know, like, you know, after Jesus uh, was crucified and also was uh, risen from the dead, that's sort of the beginning of the revival of the church in the, at that time. And, and this is basically, uh, the book of Acts is basically kind of like capturing that, that first moment where, you know, that when Jesus was basically, was risen and the, the church is basically building up to, to be one of the, uh, a church that's just full of revival at the time, right? And it's kind of interesting because uh, the book of Acts was written by Luke. And he says in my former book, so this, he actually make a reference to the, previous book, right? And I think you all know that that book is the Gospel of Luke, right? So Luke is saying, hey, look at my former book. And he said that, you know, Jesus do a lot of these things, right? and then there are three things that I want you to uh, pay attention to. First one, he says, says that Jesus presented himself to them, okay? And we will we'll learn who that person them is. He said, second, Jesus gave many convincing proof that he was alive. And third, he said that he's doing this and he spoke about the kingdom of God. So we kind of want to kind of go over those three things, how Jesus presented himself, how Jesus gave uh, many convincing proof, and all is all about the kingdom of God. And um, yeah, so again, this is basically the book of Acts and then it says the former book. So then I basically in my, in my study, I went back to the book of Luke, Gospel of Luke, and let us go through the book of Luke chapter 24. Uh, yeah, and then um, starting from uh, verse 13. I'll give you time to open it up. And I, I really don't, I don't have anything uh, here and also at home, but I really want us to, to read because as we are actively reading, I hope the rema, the revelation of God is start showing up in your life and we'll speak and study that together. Okay, book of Luke 24, chapter 13, uh, sorry, verse 13. That same day, Two of Jesus' followers were walking to the village of Emmaus, seven miles from Jerusalem. As they walked along, they were talking about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things, Jesus himself suddenly came and began walking with them. But God kept them from recognizing him. He asked them, Jesus asked them, what are you, what are you discussing so intently as you walk along? They stopped short, sadness written across their faces. Then one of them, Cleopas, replied, you must be the only person in Jerusalem who has not heard about all the things that have happened there a few, in the last few days. What things, Jesus asked. The things that happened to Jesus, the man from Nazareth. They say he was a prophet who did powerful miracles, and he was a mighty teacher in the eyes of God and all the people. But our leading priests and other religious leaders handed him over to be condemned to death, and they crucified him. We had hoped he was the Messiah who had come to rescue Israel. This all happened three days ago. Verse 22. Then some women from our group of his followers were at his tomb early this morning, and they came back with an amazing report. They said his body was missing, and they had seen angel who told them, Jesus is alive. Some of our men ran out to sea, and sure enough, his body was gone, and just as the woman had said. Then Jesus said to them, you foolish people, you find it so hard to believe all the prophets were wrote in the scriptures. Wasn't it clearly predicted that the Messiah would have to suffer all these things before entering his glory? Then Jesus took them through the writings of Moses and all the prophets, explaining from all the scriptures the things concerning himself. By the time they were nearing a mouse and the end of their journey, Jesus acted as, as if he were, going, he were going on. But they begged him, stay the night with us since it's getting late. So he went home with them. As they sat down and eat, he took the bread, blessed it. Then he broke it and gave it to them. Suddenly their eyes were open and they recognized him. And at that moment, he disappeared. So if you just continue to the next slide, I, I just want to kind of like walk through that again. So the story of the road of Emmaus, you know, 
it's showing about the, there are two follower. Uh, we don't know, one of them is Cleopas. We don't know how important the name of Cleopas is, but they're just follower of Christ. And as they're walking, they say sadness is just written all across their faces. And it's, it's obvious, whatever they're talking about, basically the death of Jesus that had happened about two to three days ago. Three days ago, because now Jesus was driven. And as you can see from the conversations, you know, sadness defeats hopelessness and anguish was clearly shown, right? They say that, well, this person, Jesus, is someone that we think uh, should have been the Messiah, we think that he is a Messiah, he was a prophet, I think he was saying that he was, he was supposed to be the prophet that can do all the powerful miracles. Oh, he was just a mighty teacher that, who has all the wisdom that can teach all the people. He said, you know, and, you know, they were just feeling so sad that they thought like there's a Messiah called Jesus and he ended up dying, dead on the cross. He said, Jesus is just another, you know, uh, God's chosen people, maybe, you know, that's, uh, that's just come to earth, teaching them about a lot of stuff, and then he, he just passed away. Jesus is just another prophet. Jesus is probably another rabbi. Jesus is probably another teacher to them. And they were so sad. And it's funny, when, when Jesus was talking to, to them, the way they described Jesus, again, in the previous it's called, they're two followers of Jesus, right? The way he described Jesus as like a third person, it's like they never have any relationship with Jesus. He said, you know what, that Jesus, he was the prophet, he, he, he was the prophet, he was the teacher, he was doing this, he was thought to be the Messiah. They refer him to be a he, a third person, as if they don't have relationship. You know, if, if, if these two people are in the modern days, they were probably the subscriber of Jesus' channel. You know, they just know about Jesus, what he can do in the, in the movie and in the, in the YouTube video, all the good stuff, the miracles that he can do, turning water to wine, you know, uh, uh, healing the, the blind. Oh, wow, this is so good movie. You know, I know him because, wow, he, he just did a lot of good content. I just know, I just know them like, like him. I just know him like that. And so he referred this guy, this guy, Jesus, as a he, as a third person. And then, interesting, he said, he said our leaders... He said, our priests. So these people, even though they quote-unquote claim to be, or they were described to be the follower of Christ, they associated themselves more towards the whatever, the, uh, whatever religion that they have at the time. They said, our leader. They feel they belong to whatever religion that was uh, kind of maybe the, the reigning religion at the time. Right? So they don't have relationship with Jesus. They do have hope for him. They're rooting for him, but they were so disappointed that well, Jesus is actually also died dead on the cross. So how does how did Jesus respond? As if you look at if you look at the story of Emmaus, it says over there all of a sudden, when Jesus was was crucified and risen, he his body went missing. Right, nobody knows exactly what happened, and the presence of Jesus physically described the first time in the story of Road of Emmaus where Jesus suddenly come, appear to them, and inserted himself into the conversations. So as you can see over here, as God is participating in these conversations, by observing their sadness, disappointment, the feel of defeat of these two people, God is starting to, talk, to walk with them, listen to them. Remember, it's a seven miles, seven miles a trip by walking, uh, probably it takes about two to two and a half hour on a given flat road, you know, Jerusalem to Emmaus, seven miles if you walk casually, it's probably about going to take you two hours. So imagine Jesus is walking with them for two hours. And along the way, as Jesus listening to their anguish, to their, to their feeling of sadness, Jesus starts start reminding them, rebuking them, look, you have all forgotten that this is what the Messiah has to do in order to be your savior. Your Messiah, your own definition of Messiah was not going to be the one who's so powerful, conquering all the Roman Empire and, you know, built an army and fight them and then destroy the Romans. No. Your Messiah has a greater purpose. That's why he has to die on the cross. Along the way, Jesus insert himself into, into these two people, the follower, quote-unquote the follower, who probably know, only know Jesus as a subscriber. And, uh, and he's teaching them along the way. 
So two hours teaching, at the end of the day, what's, um, so, what's so amazing is that these two people, even though they know Jesus, they don't know like the person that they talk to along this two, uh, two hour, seven mile walking is Jesus himself. So the, the, the culminations of their interactions is when they invite Jesus to come and sit with them and eat dinner. And what happened is that this person, the third person that they just had traveled with, like start breaking bread, uh, breaking the bread and bless the bread and give it to them. And I, I did my research yesterday, and maybe I'm wrong in my research, is that the breaking of the bread is, a, is not a tradition of the Jewish people. It is only the thing that Jesus did starting when he started his ministry. Remember when he basically tried to feed 5,000 people? That's exactly what he did. The, five, the, the breaking of the bread, the, the blessing of, of the food and the way. So I feel like what happened is like when they saw this third person the, the person that they don't know, start breaking the bread, and the way maybe he's doing it, the way he's saying it, the way he's blessing it, it tells them that that was indeed Jesus. So Jesus can easily tell them, hey, I am that person. I am you, Jesus, the one you're talking about. But Jesus listened to them first, understand about their struggles, and start teaching them. And at the end of the day, Jesus said this, look, the most important to me is that I want to have a communion with you, right? That's one reason why Jesus is showing who he really is through the Eucharist, through the communion. Um, and again, right? This, so this is the story of the two followers of, of Jesus, right? Follower, sorry, follower. And it's the same thing to some of us, right? Some of us probably have known Jesus as, uh, yeah, Christian God. Some of us probably know that all the miracles that he has done through some of the uh, Christian stories, uh, you know, Christmas just passed, so we learn about Jesus, how the, the, you know, so miraculous that, you know, the star aligning with, with where he's born and stuff like that. Some of us know him as a, you know, as a, just another God among other, other, other God, right? But we, maybe some of us are always on the fence about, hey, do I really want to go and follow this quote-unquote religion of Christians, right? Do, do I really want to give my life to this person, Jesus, uh, and, you know, and, and, and start doing what, what he's asking, what he's requiring us to do as a Christian. Maybe I don't want to be, to be this. I, I'm still not sure. I feel like this Christian is good for one thing, but then it was so restricting, and I'm like, you know. So we were, some of us were like that, this Jesus follower, know him, but have no relationship with him. So, but re remember, as, as the story shows us today, even to those people who are still in the border unsure, Jesus wants to come and insert his life to present himself to, to all of us. He wants to listen to your concern. He wants to walk in your life. He wants to walk however long your life is so that he can understand your struggle. And so he can also start teaching you. He can rebuke you for some of the maybe wrong thinking. But the most important thing, as we learn today in the story, is that the most important thing is that Jesus wants to have a communion with you. So from this story, you are part of the church, but if you've been on the fence, you have been not sure, Jesus wants to reach out to you. He wants to present himself to you. He wants to listen to you. And he wants to have a communion. Communion means it's more like a, like a covenant, you know, marrying together. As much as you want to devote yourself to him, he wants to devote his life to you. And, and, and this is the reason why I believe that this is how God wanted to build his church, by reaching the unreached, by presenting himself, and by understanding you along the way. And, and the most important thing is to have that communion. Amen? Okay, so let's go to the next point. God gives many proof. So let's continue the story. So what happened here, let me just kind of set up the, the, the story. So the, the follower had the communion, immediately recognized, wow, this is Jesus. So we've been walking two hours. For sure, this is not some ghost or something because he obviously can stay with us, talk to us. We interacted. We're breaking bread. We ate dinner together. And, and they were so excited. So what happened is that these two followers you remember from Jerusalem to Emmaus, the seven miles, they went back immediately to Jerusalem because now they were like so excited. It's like, look, I got to see, I already seen Jesus. I already see him uh, risen. They're like the first, uh, 
you know, whenever somebody who uh, waiting in line for iPhone or uh, Google Pixel, you're the first one, you know, I'm the first one. They're so proud, right? So they want to share the good news, so happy. They basically start running back towards Jerusalem, another seven miles, another two hours. Like, and that was dinner time. So I'm like, mm, that's going to be very dark. But they were so excited. They don't care. They, they say, I got to tell the disciples. Like Jesus already showing up to us. We got to tell the disciples. So this is basically the story, what happened. The follower came back to meet the disciples, and this is what happened in the, uh, in the first of 35. Okay, give me one second. Uh, okay. Then the two, again, the two from the Emmaus told the story of how Jesus had appeared to them as they were walking along the road and how they had recognized him as he was breaking the bread. And just as they were telling about it, Jesus himself suddenly standing there among them, he says, peace be with you, he said. But the whole group was startled and frightened, thinking they were seeing a ghost. Why are you frightened, he asked. Why are your hearts filled with doubt? Look at my hands. Look at my feet. You can see that it's really me. Touch me and make sure that I am not a ghost, because ghosts don't have bodies, as you see that I do. As he spoke, he showed them his hand and his feet. Still, they stood there in disbelief, filled with joy and wonder. Then he asked them, do you have anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he ate it as they watched. Then he said, when I was with you before, I have told you that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and in the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures, and he says, yes, it was written long ago that the Messiah would suffer and die and rise from the dead on the third day. It was also written that this message would be proclaimed in the authority of his name to all the nations, beginning in Jerusalem. There is forgiveness of sins for all who repent, and you are witness to all of these things. Amen. So what happened is that, okay, so the first one is how Jesus building a church by reaching out to, to, to those who have not heard maybe, and, or probably who's wondering about who Jesus is. And this one here, the second point is all about what Jesus would do to those of us who have been knowing Jesus, who have been kind of participating, participating in his ministry, know Jesus in and out. You've kind of like built your flying time, so to speak, right, with Jesus. And if you continue to, to, the, to the next slide, it says, what is the disciples' response? Well, the disciples' response were, they disbelieved. They thought like, this is God, this guy. Well, as soon as Jesus appeared and said, shalom, they were so disbelieved, fearful, because they thought they were seeing a ghost. Imagine like somebody who has seen Jesus in person, just three days ago, he died, and he saw him again three days later, and he said, oh, you're a ghost, right? They were just fearful. They were anxious. It's funny, like when you see the, the, the story, uh, Jesus said, touch my hand, you know, touch me, right? Like show, you know, touch all my wounds and everything. And they were like, maybe touching this, and they were like, uh, I don't know about that one. Uh, you know, is this really you? Right? And then they say, do you have something to eat? And as they give him fish, they were like probably watching, like Jesus probably eating, you know, hungry and he's eating, and they were like, uh, is that really Jesus? <laughs> you know? And, uh, and similarly, right, we, we also have, imagine, the disciple have been walking with Jesus for three and a half years right, before, he, before the crucifixion. They must know something about Jesus' uh, way of walking, way of talking, maybe the, the accent that he has, or, you know, like the way he probably pulled pull his hair, you know. Something about, about this person that was just so familiar, but in, in their mind, they were like, this is impossible, right? Like, how is this possible? They were like scratching their head. And similar to, to all of us, right? You know, we've known, I've known Jesus, uh, I was baptized first time in, in, when I was third grade, so that's about when I was maybe 19 years old, and here I am almost 40, and but, so I've known Jesus for 30 years, I've been faithfully serving him maybe for only, you know, only in the past 20 something years, and I have followed him all, you know, all, all, all this life, so many years. And I have known, and we all know, some of the good things, the promises that he gave us. We, we learn a lot from the church, from the Bible study, from, from the care group about how faithful God is to all of us, how he want to bless us. You know, we know all the things about Jesus when everything is, is good and, and everything is just nice. But when something like this happens right now, when a tragedy happens, when a sickness comes around, when there's so much fear in the, in the surrounding, we forget about what, who Jesus is. 
we just like, like, like when I was laying on my bed, it's not like the first time I say, thank you, Jesus, for giving me the breath of life today. You know, I could have been dead by then in, the, in that morning. But I woke up, I still breathe, and I can still think. And the first thing I think about is like, this is probably how I feel when I'm, I'm, I'm about to pass. I focus on my problem. I focus on the issue that I have instead of focusing on Jesus, right? And I think all of us make that mistake one, one way or the other, right? When a big tragedy happens, we starting to feel disbelief. We start to feel fearful, anxious, and doubtful. Really? If I believe in Jesus Christ, why do I get COVID? Why, does, why didn't Jesus protect me? He said that he, he is the guy who can protect me. He is the guy who will give me the Holy Spirit that can protect me. Why do I get, why do I get COVID if I believe in this person, Jesus Christ? Right? Um, why is it that I have to work really hard to earn my living so that I can get by every day? Why do I need to move? Maybe I'm so comfortable in the Bay Area, there's a new job, or there's something going on that I have to move to another place. I don't want to. Why, why is Jesus not preventing things from happening to me? Why is Jesus wanting me to bear my cross in order to follow him? I thought he's the, guy who, he's the God who wants to bless me. He's the God that wants to make me prosperous. Why do I have to bear my own cross? Why do I have to struggle? Why can't he be just the God that provides everything for me? as I'm showing I'm faithful to him. Why do I have to minister today? Why do I have to minister to people that maybe don't, don't, don't care about me, never say thank you to me, never doesn't care about Jesus? Why do I have to continue to minister to them? Why? They say, we say, we, I know you, God, but why? I know you, God, why is this happening? I know you, God, but why are you recurring this of me? Or sometimes we say that, you know what? We want some certain degree of assurances. Please, if this is what you really want me to do, show me by giving me the sign and wonder. Show me like, oh, okay, if you want me to minister to this person, show me. Show me by maybe making a sound or whatever. Show me. Because I know you want me to minister to them, but please let me know one more time. That we all have the same response. And how, God, how, how Jesus responds to that, to that sense of disbelief, fearfulness, anxiousness, he said he gave the disciples many times. Jesus says, look, just, just touch it. Do whatever you want. Touch it to the point where you can convince that I am indeed alive. So I'm pretty sure at the time, Jesus probably showed up physically with the holes every, you know, all of, her, all of his body and all probably the bruises and the cuts and everything, right? And, and I did search about how, how tormentous it is to be crucified. A lot of people think that, you know, like in the, in the pictures, a lot of people think that the, the, the nail actually went through the palm. No, it's actually not. The, the, the nails actually went through the two bones that you have on your hand. That's where they basically pierce uh, and basically nail it to the cross. And it serves two things, because this is a, a much stronger bone than your, your palm. Because of that, the nail and the bone can basically support your body as you get hanged, right? But the other purpose of piercing the nail over there is to sever the nerve. So what happened, as the nail goes through this particular section of the palm, it, it severed the nerve where you no longer can control your hand. Your hand becomes motionless so as you can they were pierced you know the hand that jesus can no longer control the hand okay so the only thing that is supporting his body is the the support that the nail give on the bone such a painful thing and it's such a traumatic thing because now jesus cannot do anything with the hand both hands right so that's the first thing and you will you will learn why shortly and on the feet they, they definitely nail, uh, nail it on the feet. But not only that, they say in the, in the Roman traditions, what they end up doing after they nail, they basically break the leg so that they, the leg can no longer support the weight of the body. So the point of them to sever so that you cannot have any control of your hand and you cannot support your body through your leg is that so that your body will slouch forward. 
basically, that's the only natural way gravity takes over, your body slouch forward, and that's a suffocation. That's a punishment suffocation because if your body can no longer support anything, your diaphragm just do not have to support and you cannot breathe. So that is a drowning in the middle of an air. If you want to know how, how to drown people without water, that's what you do. Break the leg, sever the arm, that person will die. And so what happened is that Jesus in that moment, he was just fighting for grasping for air. I don't know how many hours is that, but you know, imagine like when you cannot breathe and you just basically trying to do everything just to take one inhale of oxygen and, and suffer and suffer the pain again and then do it again, do that again. And imagine the hours that has to go by with that kind of pain and suffering. So the, the, my point is telling you this is that by showing the, 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 the nail and whatever that's broken and everything, Jesus was telling them, look, you know how this thing goes. A human being cannot survive through crucifixions. It's not like Jesus was pulling some magic trick where, you know, he got pulled and somehow somebody helped him, whatever, or he has the power to, you know, to, to be able to, to survive. No, when somebody got cru crucified, it's for sure death is the end for that person. And just by telling him, like, look, look at where the nail is. Look at where the broken is. Look at where the wound is. Look at all the stabs that they did to basically, you know, drain my blood away. I surely was dead. But now here I am again. Right? By doing that, Jesus walking them through the story of crucifixions again. Right? And it's interesting, after he showed them, he said, he started talking to them and he started teaching them about, um, about the verse, the, the, the scriptures again. He said in the, give me one second. In verse 45, and when it has, as he talked to them, he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. So as God, as Jesus, now look, right? He started touching them and he said, I have told you everything that was written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and in the Psalms. They all have to be fulfilled in me. And immediately in verse 45, Jesus opened their mind. Imagine, you have been walking with the, the highest rabbi, the most knowledgeable rabbi. He's the God himself walking for three and a half years. He has been teaching them, and we've seen them, like how many times Jesus teach them about what is to come and what the sufferer has to do. It never clicked in their mind for some reason. I don't know why. It probably is easy for us to understand what happened, but these are the people who have been listening to the preaching, and they just never get it. And only at that moment, Jesus like, boom revelations and that's when they understand so at that moment god gave them two things they gave them the divine inspirations and god gave them the divine revelations and same thing to all of us as we are walking right in our life we have so many tragedy we we experience hardships we we extreme challenges it's so easy that we focus on our problem then we start forgetting about all the good things that God has walked us through. All the win, all the high points in our life. When we were losing, we lose our job, we were so sad. But we forgot when God blesses us with our first job, when God blesses us with our promotions, when God put us into like a very nice company that we work with or maybe make your business successful at one point. That's the divine inspirations that we should take a record, right? Every time God blesses you with something that is really, really awesome, good for you, write it down. Because you will need those in one of those times when you say, when I am down, when I have no more hope, then you can go back, look at your history, how much you can draw inspirations from that. That Jesus has taken you from one place to the next level, to the next level, to the next level, to the next level, up to that point. Do you think that God just take you from that point to the high point just to let you drop? This is the reason why we have to, that God asks us to, to be inspired, divinely inspired, because he, when, when we accept him as a God, he is going to work in our life. He's going to bless us with a lot of things. And if we are not sensitive to the blessing that he has, then we are going to be oblivious. So we need to start counting our blessings. We need to start remembering our blessing so that when things hard, hard things come by, we are going to stand strong because we were already inspired by all the things that he has done in our life. Second, 
that when we are in the, in our, in the midst of our challenges, the Word of God has been made available to us through the Bible. That's when all the mystery of God was kept mysterious. But when we're looking for it, when we were, sometimes when we're reading the Bible, right, like this road of a mouse, right? I've, I've never thought that I'm going to explain it this way, right? I've read this story so many times and never clicked to me that this is what, what, what is happening, that Jesus himself gave the revelations to us so that this is how God wants us to start the church. He wants to choose a people that is just strong despite of all the weaknesses. He chose the disciple. He chose you and me, the, the, the follower of Christ, the disciple of Christ, so that when we are following him, no matter what happened, we're going to stand strong because of what we remember what happened in the past through inspirations, and we know what's going to happen in the future through our revelations. So by reading through the Bible, right, sometimes the Bible just doesn't make any sense at that moment, right? Just read it through, not because you want to remember, you want to uh, memorize it, but when things hard happen, then you say, you know what? I have read one time before in the past about this story. I think that story wants to speak to me. Let me Google it up. Thank go take goodness for Google now. Right? Like, like today, I just, I just, I just share you the, uh, the book of 2 Corinthians. The God, God only told me this. When I'm weak, I'm strong. Find that, find that, find that. And I just look it up, Google. Where is this I am weak, I am strong? Right? And sure enough, when God speaks... He's not going to tell you, open Corinthians, or maybe, yeah, maybe it, it works in certain people, but he'll just give you like, I'm weak, I'm strong. Why? Because you have read it. If you just listen to it, you're not paying attention. It's never click, it never register in your brain. But when you read the Bible, even though as boring it is, it will somehow register. And when God reminds you, just Google it up, and you will see the revelations of God. And so that's how God wants to build a church to the go to the next slide. So to the people who who's probably not necessarily know him, he, he will present himself. He will listen to you. He will teach you. For some of us who have been with God, God is going to continue to give us the inspirations and revelations. And why he's doing that? It's because he is starting the kingdom of God. It's all about the kingdom of God. The book of Acts talks about the beginning of a church the beginning of a, the, the church that's following the, the teaching of Jesus Christ. But same thing, God's plan does not, was not centered around that moment, you know, whatever AD that number is, at that moment when Peter becomes the first apostle and he built the church. No, his plan is everlasting, timeless. He's doing this, reaching out to you and me, teaching us to, to be strong in, in the midst of our adversity so that we, we are building the kingdom of God. So, Yes, when Jesus was risen again and he can show up to everybody and show, uh, show up to Pontius Pilate and you know what, like I am alive. I am now the new king. He said that and basically just built an army to destroy Romans, right? He can do that. But God chose a different way because he wants to empower all of us. Instead of taking over the kingdom by himself, he chose us to partake in building his kingdom by bringing you and me out of darkness out of our pits of life to the lights, out of the weak situations, we become strong. And not just you and me, but to those people out there who have never received the word of God, right? So he wants to bring those people also from the darkness to light. And he's not just building this kingdom of God to show that, well, he's the sovereign of all universe. The fact that he can beat death, right? To, and show it to all of us, to those two people, to the disciples, not to show that, look, I am the master of the multiverse. He's not like the, you know, he's like maybe the, 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 the top hero of the Marvel universe or whatever, whatever universe you want to call it, right? God is showing to, to them at the time and God is showing to us that he is sovereign. The law of physics does not work in him. He is just that powerful. And he can start the kingdom of God just like that. But he chose the number two. He wants to be the ruler of all the people whose heart and life were submitted to him and submitted to his authority. And this is what the type of kingdom that he wants to build, right? And he gives you and me the freedom to choose. If you don't want to be part of his kingdom, that's fine. But every single time when you are thinking of turning away from Jesus, Jesus will continue to present himself again to you and say, look, I, I know you, I listen to you, I want to have a communion with you. For those of you who are struggling with him, 
feel like, what is it that we have to do as a Christian? Why the Christian has to be the, the jongos, you know, jongos like uh, the lowest people on the, on the rank? Why do we have to always minister? Why can I be the one who leads everybody, right? Jesus says, you know, it's because there's a new thing. There's a revelation that he wants to show to all of us. All because he wants to build a kingdom of God. And he's not just bringing a church that's just lethargic. He wants to build a church that is just alive, thriving, healthy, creative, powerful, dynamic, right? And a church that's alive is going to be a church that's going to be bringing attention, bringing, uh, you attract people. It doesn't matter about, uh, it doesn't matter about our, our numbers. It does not matter about, you know, you know how, how less of a people we have over here. The fact that we as a church thrive despite of all our challenges, it shows that we want to do something different. The people that over here, pastors start wailing, you know, and, you know, somebody help Kylie trying to do switching. It's because they want to do, they want to be a church that's alive. We just don't take our situation and feel defeated. We just don't take our situation. And you know what? You know what? Let's, let's not have a church today. Everybody can stay home. They can watch Hillsong. They can watch what, whatever, whatever. No, they choose to pers persevere today. It's because they care about you at home and they care about other people who probably will listen to this message. Not my message. It's God's message. And that is a church that's alive. It does not matter where we are as a church. We have to choose to stay alive. And it starts with Jesus. It's centered around Jesus because that's how Jesus built his kingdom. And we need to, as a church, we need to start thinking as a person, right? maybe not as a church, maybe as a person first, as a family. We need to start thinking beyond just ourselves. It's easy to say, you know what, I am, I'm, I'm so afraid, I don't want to do this, I don't want to do that, I don't want to go to church, I don't want to minister. It's so easy to say, uh, you know, as a, my family is this, blah, 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 blah. Yes, I, I am part of that. I, I'm, I'm equally uh, guilty, right? But we need to start thinking think about, think bigger than ourselves. And what I'm saying in the midst of, in the context of this COVID, right? We're trying to build the momentum. We're trying to, it's not about, it's not about be ex ex existing in the YouTube verse, right? No, uh, you know, this church always pumping out videos. No. We are building, we are tri we're trying to thrive, to be a thrive church. We try to basically keep going, keep going to the best that we can. And I'm not asking people to be reckless, okay? If you're sick, if you, if you got the COVID, stay home. Get healed faster, take care of yourself, take care of your family. Don't be reckless and say, you know what, because of church, church is calling me to be alive, I'm going to be there. It doesn't matter whether I'm sick or not. When, when you are sick, stay home. But when you are here getting together, Let's do the best that we can so that we individually, maybe we feel sacrificed a little bit, but as a corporate, as a church, we are thriving. We function, right? Because when everybody's here is healthy, we can do mighty things. Today, we only have less than 10 people. We can do live stream. Imagine when we have 30 people. Imagine what we could do as a church. The type of presentations, the style, the transition, the music, the sermon, whatever. We can do so much better because then... That's how the news was spread out. That's all the good, the gospel's news was spread out to other people. If you choose to be defeated, then some people may not necessarily receive the, the, the good news today. So it is not about you, it's not about me. Yes, we need to practice wisdom. We need to be safe. I, I totally, I want to emphasize that. But beyond that, we need to start thinking beyond ourselves. We need to start saying, how do I participate to make sure that my church, I, as part of the church, is alive. And, and going back, is that we need to honor what Jesus has started. Jesus reaching out to you and me at one point in our life. And then he continued to give us inspiration. He continued to give us revelation so that you and me can continue to fight. Fight, fight, fight until we're, we're done. Because when we are weak, then God is strong. Because of that, the church is going to be alive. And, and I believe, I want to encourage you, again, I, I really hope there's not a, any condemnations whatsoever. I'm, I'm equally guilty in all of this, some, some of this. But I really want to encourage that we need to start thinking a big beyond, like in order for the church to be alive, 
It starts with Jesus. And if you're really, really, really passionate about Jesus, really passionate about, you know, what, what people could have, could have experienced by us working together as a church, then we're going to be reaching out more and more people. And don't be disappointed with the quantity right, that we have right now. I, I mentioned this to the to the this morning service. Last night I was I was laying on my bed. I say, God, what is the, what is it that you want to tell me? Because I know tomorrow is going to be a, a challenging day. And he told me like, you know, Pino, you guys used to be only 35 people. At one point, you guys only 35 people. Many many years ago, maybe some of you were not here before. 35 people every week. It's such a demotivating, you know such a disappointing to only see 35 people but God says that when you're ready I gave you a lot of people at one point the church probably 150 more now we have two campuses right the challenge is probably now shrinking the numbers down again why, why do we have to be disappointed there is no need to be disappointed because this is our training ground because when the harvest is ready we are ready that's what God is telling me. Don't be discouraged. Be encouraged because this is basically now the time when I can show you my power. He said, when you are weak, I am strong. And uh, he said, that just stay faithful. The harvest is coming. And we just need to be ready. If the harvest is here and we're not ready for the challenges, we're going to be a church that is lethargic. So we need to be as a church in the next one year, 2022. I don't know how many versions and variants of COVID that we're going to have. We got to do something. We cannot be like this every time. We need to stay alive. Maybe the format has to change. It does not matter. But the thing is, we have to stay alive. We need to be stay productive because we have harvest to reap. We have harvest to, to catch on. Simple as that. Because God is not calling us to be just a follower. He's calling all of us so that we can be a witness. The two people who become followers, become a witness to the disciples. That's how God wants us to transform from a follower to become a witness and to become a leader so that we as a church becomes alive. Hallelujah. Let's pray.